failures of flat tappet type camshafts is something that's very, very common. Seems to happen an awful lot to people. And you search it on the internet and you find a load of pretty useless information. We're gonna talk about the real causes of it, the real facts, and how you can definitely overcome this problem, which I'm sure loads of you have had. I've had it myself. So here we go. To begin with, let's look at a standard camshaft that's been in service for some time and hasn't really undergone a failure, but we can see how it wears, okay? So, this camshaft here is a standard camshaft from an Essex V6. It's the one I took out of the uh, race engine I was building uh, to build, to put a race cam in it. And it hasn't actually failed per se, but it has worn. And you can see when you look at it, that the wear is concentrated on one side of the cam lobe. That's because the cam lobe actually isn't square, it's actually tapered. And that's designed to spin the tappet and keep it rotating so that the wear is even on the tappet. Also, the tappet is domed slightly. It's not actually flat, as it's, although it's called a flat tappet. It's not, it's got a slight dome to it. And that again aids with the wear. Now, this, like I say, this hasn't failed. So when this, when this was installed, this cam was bedded in correctly, all the spring pressures were correct, all the setup was correct, and there was no actual failure on this. But let's go through some types of failures that can happen and do happen, very common, and how we overcome them. So, let's look at this camshaft. This is out of a, a Rover V8, okay? This camshaft has done very minimal use, probably less than 2,000 miles. Yet, you can see pieces of the tops of the cam lobes uh, missing. You can see uh, excessive wear on the tops of the cam lobes here as well. And it's not completely failed, but it's heading that way. And if you look at the followers that go with this cam, they have failed. Okay, these, these followers are heavily pitted. They're no longer domed. They're in fact concave. Um, and it wouldn't be long before this engine completely lunches itself as all of this debris floating around in the oil, ruining your bearings, getting into oil system. So we caught it just in time. Now, what causes that kind of failure? Okay, so there's many reasons for it. One thing could be that the bedding procedure wasn't, wasn't properly uh, adhered to, which is quite important, especially when you're using like this, which is a slightly uprated cam or a race cam. So when you're bedding in, you actually need to coat the camshaft completely in assembly grease. We use the driven assembly grease. The other thing, which is like a high pressure grease. The other thing that uh, you do is you use a high zinc bedding in oil, which is also uh, typically non-synthetic, so like a 30 weight. Uh, and you can get motorsport bedding in oils, that's the one we use. And then when, you're, when you run the car up for the engine up for the first time, you need to take it straight up to two and a half thousand RPM and fluctuate the RPM between two and a half thousand to three thousand RPM. And ideally, if it's a fresh engine build, you want to be doing that in a rolling road because you also don't want to be glazing the bores of the, of the pistons you've just done as well. You want to be putting some load on it in the rollers so you're accelerating from uh, in like top gear from uh, two and a half grand to three thousand RPM and back again. And you keep doing that for about half an hour. Now, why are you running it at like 3000 RPM? You think you'd want to run it lower than that. That's to make sure you've got a huge amount of oil supply. So that, because if your engine's idling, oil pressure could be low and you're not getting sufficient oil delivery to the camshaft. But at 3000 RPM, you're definitely going to have plenty of oil pressure and plenty of oil flying around up the top end there. So that's the reason for that. Then once that's complete, you need to then take the oil filter off, cut it open, look inside, make sure there's no debris in there. You'll probably see it'll look a bit metallic, but it shouldn't, there shouldn't be any large pieces or anything like that in there. And then you need to drain the oil, do the same with that, check that over, make sure there's no large pieces or anything odd looking in there. It might have a bit of a shimmy shine to it, but that's normal because you're cleaning off and honing the bores with the, you know, honing, the rings are getting honed into the bores. So you're getting all that debris go down, but it's, it's very small particles. So all that sort of thing's normal. Okay, and when that's complete, then you can then put your normal oil in the car. Uh, we would, on a classic like this, it might be like a Valvoline VR um, uh, 2050. Um, and then you can then continue to do your normal bedding in procedure for the rest of the engine, which would take maybe 200 miles, you know, of driving sort of thing. And then 
The other thing I would do is I would also check to see what your lift is after the before and after that bed in process. So I get a dial indicator gauge, put it on top of one of the, the uh, valve spring retainers and see what actual lift you've got on all of your uh, valves and then do the same after it's bedded in and to make sure that suddenly, hang on a second, one of my, one of my uh, valves has got a lot less lift, perhaps because it's knocked its lobe off, you see. Okay, so another important thing to note about bedding in procedure, if you're using uprated valve springs like duplex springs or stiff single springs, then you need to put a weak spring in or take out the inner spring of a duplex spring so during the bedding in procedure. That's to prevent excessive load being put on the cam whilst it's doing that critical bedding in process. Once it's bedded in after the half hour, then you can then do what we're doing here and use a special tool, turn it to TDC, use this special tool to compress the spring in situ and then replace the valve spring with, it, with the um, high uprated ones. So that's bedding in. The next thing that could cause it is potentially uh, coil bind. So perhaps when the engine was assembled, especially if it's a racing cam, you weren't too careful with checking to make sure what your uh, springs were set up to, what they were shimmed to. So that, because if you're putting a racing cam in, there'll be a lot of lift going on. It could be well over half an inch of lift, you know? So you've got to check. You can, you can do it physically by um, putting the cam in, do a dry assembly, cam in, all your valve train assembled, rotate it, and then check to see with feeler gauges what's the gap between your coils. There may also be specs in, on the data sheet for your springs or for your camshaft as to say um, what's the maximum lift the spring can handle before it coil binds. You can look at that data as well. But the key thing is to make sure that there is a gap. That, uh, and it doesn't want to be just ever so just, it needs to be a reasonable, reasonable gap so that when it's revving hard, there's no chance that it's going to uh, bind. Because of course, the reason the coil binding is an issue is that that coil becomes solid and it will very quickly knock the top of the lobe off. Excessive spring pressure. So it's similar to the thing about saying we've got to make sure that we've shimmed it correctly, but there should be a seat pressure and uh, a nose pressure. So you should have like a max lift pressure if you like. The seat pressure will be specified, but normally on the um, camshaft data. Um, and what you want to make sure is that you've, you're achieving your, your seat pressure that's required, so it seals when there's no cam acting on the valve, but also that your uh, seat pressure required at max lift isn't excessive, because if it is too high, that excessive pressure will again cause the cam to fail. So the way to check all this sort of stuff is with a proper spring pressure tester like this, so for example, you know, this is a standard road spring. We put this in here, okay. Right, and so on this gauge, I can read the deflection. So say we've got like a half inch of lift on the engine, okay. So we go to there. At a half inch of lift, this spring only produces 90 pounds of force. That might be seat pressure, for example. So when it's installed, you might compress it by half an inch to have it at its seat pressure. But what, the, what I'm saying is that Per half inch of deflection, you've got 90 pounds. Now, if I put in this uh, uprated spring, which is for a Ford uh, V8 289 engine, and that's the standard spring for the Ford V8 289. I put it to that, and I do a half an inch of deflection on this. We can see a half an inch of deflection, we've got 220 pounds of pressure, over double. So that's why you're very careful because you could very quickly exceed the maximum pressure allowed on the camshaft if you shim this comp competition spring incorrectly. Uh, so your competition camshafts are much more prone to uh, failure than a standard road cam. The incorrect oil. As I already mentioned about bedding in process, you have to use the correct oil for the bedding in process, which is a high zinc oil uh, and like normally a mineral oil, 30 weight that sort of thing. Um, but also once it once the cam is bed in, if you've got a high performance cam, you also wanna make sure you choose the right oil for, it, for its general use, especially in racing applications. Anything that's got a bit of zinc in it, but typically we would recommend something like the Valvoline VR1 uh, 2050 for the classic stuff. Or if you wanna go a bit more serious, you can use the Fushu's Titan Pro, which is like an ester based oil. That's what I use in mine. Um, both are very good. Now this next bit is the secret bit that no one tells you, but this will pretty much, say you've exhausted all those other things, because uh, you've got like some absolutely wild camshaft that just keeps getting destroyed. You can't keep it from eating itself. 
then these two things will definitely fix that problem, okay? The first one is tool steel tappets, so, uh, or diamond-like coating, DLC tappets, there's two types. Okay, either one of those will help prevent this problem. The, the, the reason is that if you use a, a tool steel tappet, it is so hard that it cannot wear in comparison to the cast iron camshaft. Typically what happens is when you've got a problem where say the, yeah, the spring pressure is really high and it's been able to overcome the oil film thickness and the cam has actually contacted the tappet, what it'll do with a standard tappet is it will mark the tappet and scuff it and begin to damage it. And then once this hard, harder than the cast iron tappet is scuffed, that scuff then wears the cam, the cam wears the tappet again, and it's a horrible vicious cycle. But if you use tool steel tip tappets, they are so hard they can't be marked. And that, that way, well, that can't be, I mean, I'm sure in extreme cases you'd find a way of doing it, but from my point of view, they are very reliable and that'll, that'll help stop a, a cam failure progressing. You know, if it's, if it's managed to overcome the film thickness and touch the tappet, it will be okay, it'll carry on and it's fine. Same thing goes for the DLC type ones. They're like a ceramic coated uh, tappet. They're expensive as well. I mean, the tool steel tappets are very pricey and the DLC ones are even more so. But if you've gone through a lot of camshafts and you're racing, this is what will solve the problem. The other good thing about the tool steel ones, they often come with a EDM hole in them. So there's like a little hole in the center of the tappet that helps feed oil to the cam lobe itself, which is also very beneficial. So that's, that's my absolute top tip to uh, go for those. I have had to buy them from the States in the past from a company called Comp Cams, uh, but they seem they make a, a handful of uh, sizes, but they seem to fit most engines that have ever been made. So you should be able to find the right tappet for your engine. Um, the other option is to basically do away with the flat tappet cam and put a uh, roller cam in instead. And that would definitely not fail, but that could be very costly and, and or, not be eligible for your, if you're doing certain types of racing, you're probably not allowed to use it. And the other thing is they may not make one for your engine as well. So you are probably stuck with a traditional style iron camshaft. I'll just quickly show you the rest of these camshaft failures that I've got on my bench. So the first one was a standard road cam, that was just general wear. The second one was about to become a major failure, um, but caught in time. The third one is a pretty major failure. It's actually in three pieces. That's an unusual type of cam failure, um, but these are quite delicate. I've had them posted to us and they ended up snapped in half because the delivery drivers dropped the box. This one in actual fact broke because a rocker arm stud snapped inside the engine and the uh, parts of the rocker arm went down into the engine, jammed the cam and snapped it in three places. So that's the reason for that failure. Uh, then the next one we've got along here is a reprofiled cam, which was, driven so much uh, even after it started to fail that the cam lobe has pretty much become round on this on this cylinder here. So, and, and on this one as well, this one's particularly bad. So that just goes to show how, how it can just continue, once that tappet is damaged, that the cam will continue to eat itself. Okay, so I think the key thing to take away from this is that you do make sure you go through all the procedures I mentioned earlier especially when you're building a like a slightly racy engine because you don't want to have a failure like this and if you follow all that stuff then you should be fine but it is all too common that people will just buy a cam kit and slap it in and put the normal oil in it and just take it off for a drive and it's dead so yeah don't ignore it because it's a real problem uh, and um, yeah hopefully you won't have any failures